There are really only three possibilities of what this could be. And the first possibility is that it is some sort of secret U.S. tech that somehow uh, we have managed to keep secret even from ourselves for, for a long period of time. The second option is that it's some sort of foreign adversarial technology that has somehow managed to technologically leapfrog ahead of our country, uh, despite having a, a fairly robust and comprehensive in, in intelligence apparatus. And of course, the, the third option is, is something quite entirely different. It's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. That is not our technology. Uh, and that's that's hugely important. And I think we're now beginning to learn, as we've heard from the director of national intelligence, and I can certainly tell you from my experience, that we're pretty confident that it's not Russian or, or Chinese technology. Uh, furthermore, if you had this type of technology, you probably wouldn't need to invest so much in military because you had this, if you will, checkmate type technology or capability where everything else now becomes obsolete. Do I feel or do I believe this is, quote, extraterrestrial? Let me be very careful before I answer that by saying, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think or what I believe. What matters is what the data and the facts tell us. Uh, and from that perspective, it's very important that I've, I've, I've always, I had a very simple job, and that is to collect the truth and speak the truth. We are human beings that a lot of people in, in psychology refer to as cardiosocial animals means we look at things in extremes because for the first nine months of our existence, we, we were in our mother's womb and we heard that binary heartbeat of our mother. And so we tend to look at the life, if you will, and our universe in that, that binary way. But in reality, the universe and physics is, isn't binary. It's not binary at all. In fact, there's all sorts of options and opportunities of what this could be. Is it from here or is it from out there? Um, we don't really know. In fact, there's lots of other options on the table. It, it could be from, as I've said before, it can be from outer space, inner space, or the space in between. As we begin to, to learn what quantum physics is, and we begin to understand our place here on this little planet, we begin to realize that there's a lot of other options. Uh, we, we judge the universe in five fundamental uh, senses, uh, the ways that we perceive the universe. And, and if, you can't, uh, if you can't use those senses to look at something or measure it, then we really can't interact with it. And yet we know the majority of, of, of the universe around us, 99% of it, in fact, is not perceivable. Uh, there are right now Wi-Fi signals coursing through your body. There's cosmic radiation coming in from the cosmos. There's neutrinos coming in from, from the sun. There's radar hitting you from the local airport. And yet these are all realities and, and you can't interact with it because we just don't have the tools to do so. Take a beautiful night sky, look at the stars, and you might say, wow, that's, that's really a, a pretty sky. But if you now take a radio telescope and look at that same spot in the sky, all of a sudden you begin to see things that you couldn't see before. You see in the ultraviolet, you see in the infrared spectrum, you see nebula. So I guess my, my long-winded point to all this is that we must keep all options open. If we already know that 99% of the universe we cannot perceive or interact with, um, then there may be other options here. This may not necessarily be something from outer space. In fact, this could be something as natural to our very own planet as us. We're just now at a point where we're beginning to technologically be able to interact and collect data. This could be something from under the oceans. This could be something from, yes, from outer space. This conversation is shifting from a, 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 a human technology, quite possibly, we don't know for sure yet, but to something far more profound. We are quite convinced that we're dealing with a technology that is, is multi-generational, uh, several uh, several generations ahead of what we consider next generation technology. So what we would consider beyond next generation technology, something that could be anywhere between 50 to a thousand years ahead of us. And these things have, a, uh, have a, a tendency to be seen in and around water, which, which kind of leads to one of the observables uh, that we've had. There's five distinct observables that set this technology, as I mentioned earlier, aside from everything we have in our inventory. The first is hypersonic velocity, the ability to change directions instantly. Um, and, and when I say instantly, I mean human beings can withstand about 9G forces. Uh, our, some of our best aircraft can withstand about 16 Gs. These things are doing three, four, 600 Gs uh, in mid-flight. Uh, then there's hypersonic velocity. Uh, that is speeds that by definition are Mach 5 or above. Very, very fast. We do have some technology. You mentioned Russian hypersonics and things like that. You know, there, there are technologies that can go that fast, but then again, you don't expect a hypersonic aircraft to do a 90 degree turn. Uh, to put that into context, 
Our SR-71 Blackbird went at 3,200 miles an hour, wants to take a right-hand turn. It takes roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. You don't expect it to just kind of do this. Uh, and that's precisely what we're seeing. And then the third observable is a bit like cloaking. We call it low observability. But the fourth observable is what, what we were talking about, and that's transmedium travel and water. The ability for, for an object to fly not only in our atmosphere, low and high altitudes, but also potentially in a vacuum environment like space and even underwater. Now, we do have vehicles that can do that. We have, a, for example, an, a, a seaplane. A seaplane is, is a plane that can fly and it can float on the water. But when you look at it, it's neither really a very good aircraft or a boat because it's a design compromise. And yet what we are seeing are objects that can operate in all these domains or all these environments seemingly without any type of performance compromise. And so why are we seeing these things around in and around water is something that we're really we're really kind of scratching our heads with because we've seen these things they have been recorded not only in our atmosphere, but there is data to suggest that they have also been tracked by some of our, our capabilities underwater as well and being able to perform in ways that frankly exceed anything that we know we, on, on the planet right now. Is it one of our secret technologies? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, for several reasons. First of all, I had access to all those programs and those type of programs. You don't typically test these type of secret aircraft in and around areas where you're doing active maneuvers. Um, you, you tend to test them at secret test ranges like Area 51. You certainly don't endanger uh, pilots' lives by testing this type of secret technology. So we very quickly realized it wasn't our technology. The second option is, is it foreign adversarial technology? Is it Russian? Is it Chinese? We've been seeing this technology for decades. And when you compare that to where we were, let's say in the late 1940s and 50s, we were just ex exploring and learning the secrets of the atom. We were unlocking its secrets. We had just entered the jet age and we hadn't even been into space. And yet these, these technologies were outperforming anything and everything that we have. So if this was some sort of foreign adversary technology that's been around for 70 years this would be considered probably the worst intelligence failure my country has ever experienced the last option is well if it's not our technology and it's not some sort of foreign adversarial technology then then whose or or what is it what exactly are these if they're not ours the most famous uh, case that we had it was in 2004. It involved the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. And there you have uh, one of the escort ships with the latest uh, Spy-1 radar capability beginning to pick up some sort of weird anomaly. And both are now looking at some sort of object, we'll call it an object, coming in from 80,000 feet and within, within less than a second, now hovering 50 feet over the water. They get vectored to, to the area, and the first thing they notice is some water roiling on, on the ocean. He describes as this white, and it's about 40 feet long. There's no windows, no, no real wings or control surfaces, no obvious signs of propulsion, and yet this object is witnessed now by four separate individuals and two separate aircraft bouncing back and forth almost like a ping pong ball right over the surface of the water. So as he goes down and, and to take a closer look at this, all of a sudden, this thing begins to react. As Commander Fravor's coming in for a better look, this thing begins to maintain its distance. And all of a sudden, like that, it's gone. It absolutely disappears over the horizon within, within about a second. Now, what's even more scary, which is in about five seconds afterwards, this object now is picked up once again on radar 60 miles away. When you look at this video, a couple things to the trained eye you'll begin to notice. First of all, uh, is the, the telemetry that you see on the screen is altitude. Now, when an aircraft banks 90 degrees, you hear what they say, wow, it, it, this is compelling and the thing is rotating. Well, not only is it rotating, but it's not losing lift. So aircraft that have wings, whenever you're gonna do a bank and you're gonna turn, when you do that, you lose lift and you lose altitude. And yet this is not losing altitude. And as you hear them say, it's going 120 knots against the wind, right? So we're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. We're not talking about a balloon. At 25,000 feet, we're not talking about a, a quadcopter or a drone, and we're not talking about an aircraft. And if you look at that, it doesn't really look like an aircraft, does it? It looks looks peculiar, it looks almost like a, like a top. And then furthermore, what you don't see on the video, 
but you hear in, in, in the exasperation of the of pilots is that there's a whole fleet of them. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. And so what's important to know here is sometimes not just what you see on screen, but it's the complete picture. It's sometimes just what you don't see and also what you can hear. When you said there's a whole fleet of them, what did they look like? How were they maneuvering? What were they doing? What separates these from anything else that we have in our current inventory is quite simple. There's five observables that associate, when you look at something as a UAP, an identified aerial phenomena, as being truly unique. That's instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity, low observability, transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple environments or domains, and last but not least in, in the vernacular would be anti-gravity. The ability to fly with no wings, control surfaces, uh, no obvious signs of propulsion, even frankly, not even a cockpit. Unfortunately, all I, I can say is that it is my uh, belief that the United States is in possession of, uh, of exotic material. And unfortunately, that's, that's, that's about all I can, I can say at this time. Whether or not these are real, this is a fact. This, we're here, folks. Uh, the question is, what is it? Where is it from? What is its intent? Uh, and, and what can or should we be doing about it?